I'm going to start with the whiteboard and I'm going to teach you about radiation and what comes out of nuclear power plants and what's at Hanford and what's in the Columbia Generating Station so you understand and I'll teach you how radiation causes cancer, okay? So you've got the basic dynamics of what it's all about. So there are four sorts of radiation, x-rays, and you've all had x-rays. Each dose of radiation you get adds to your risk of getting cancer. It's cumulative. Never have an unnecessary x-ray and do not get your teeth x-rayed every year. You do not need dental x-rays unless you've got a really sore tooth. Um, I know my husband was a radiologist. They make a lot of money and don't contribute to their funds. <laughs> when you get an x-ray, they say, breathe in, hold it. They run out of the room and go, click. And in that instant, you're radiated, but you don't become radioactive. Okay, but in that instant, your genes can be damaged in your cells so that later on you can develop cancer. Um, X-rays, one X-ray to the pregnant abdomen of a woman doubles the incidence of leukemia in that baby. That's why they say, when was your last menstrual period? And you don't get X-rays in your second part of your menstrual cycle because you could have ovulated and you may be pregnant. Then there's gamma radiation, which is like X-rays, non-particulate, form of energy that goes straight through you and this is like x-rays and that's given off by radioactive materials made in nuclear power plants. Um, then there's alpha, radi alpha radiation which is a particulate form of radiation composed of two protons and two neutrons emitted from an unstable atom. And for instance uranium is an alpha emitter and is, so is plutonium. And in fact you can hold an alpha emitter in your hand, and this radiation doesn't penetrate dead skin. And it, it will be blocked by um, a piece of paper, but once it's in your body, for instance, in your lung, and you inhale some plutonium, which those people did out at WIP in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the, 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 the radiation travels a tiny distance, and the cells close to it all die, because it's such very high energy radiation. But as radiation decreases with the square of the distance on the periphery, cells remain viable. And in every cell, um, there are the chromosomes. And arranged on the chromosomes are the genes. This is a simplified version. And in every cell, there's a, cell that, there's a gene that controls the rate of cell division called the regulatory gene. And it's composed of DNA. And so if that is hit by an alpha particle or an X or gamma ray, then the cell can change biochemically and it will sit quietly for any time from time for two to 80 years. And that's in incubation time for cancer, whereas if I sneeze on you, you'll be sneezing in two days. The incubation time for measles, mumps, chicken pox, rubella is three weeks. But for cancer, it's a long, cryptogenic, latent time and that's the ace up the sleeve of the nuclear industry. Because they can say, no one died. See, no one died. You've got cancer. Lots of people get cancer. Do you see? And you have to do epidemiological studies to prove that a certain exposed population has a much higher than normal rate of cancer. And we'll get to that. Beta radiation is just an electron shot out from an unstable atom. Tritium is a beta radiation uh, isotope. And the nuclear industry says, it's all right. It's just tritium. It's just part of water. Don't worry. Don't believe anything the nuclear industry says, because <laughs> they lie. OK, so that's just basic, how, uh, basic radiation biology, very simplified. Uh, you also need to know that children are particularly sensitive to radiation, 10 to 20 times more sensitive than an adult male. And, and neonates, um, not neonates, but fetuses are extremely sensitive to radiation, maybe thousands of times more. And little girls are twice as sensitive as little boys. We don't know why. Women are more sensitive than men. And this is all in a study uh, done by the National Academy of Sciences um, called BEAR7, the Biological Effects of Radiation. So we've known this for a long time, but the nuclear industry uses a standard 70 kilogram white 26-year-old male to say, okay, we can have that sort of radiation and anyone can have that sort of radiation because this guy um, can tolerate it without much cancer. 
they take no account of the heterogeneity of the population. And when they had those X-ray machines in the airports, which I think they've now removed, the whole population was going through them. Fetuses, babies, children, old people who are very sensitive to radiation, immunosuppressed people who are also very sensitive to radiation. I think now the Transport Authority, or whatever they're called, has removed them. I never went through them. I had a whole body check and I didn't care what, what they felt on my body. I wasn't going to be x-rayed. Okay, so now with that sort of preliminary um, discussion, um, let's go and look at what, um, I'll just, can we move this sideways now please? And we'll put on the first slide. Uh, what radioactive elements are made in a nuclear power plant? Because all you really hear about is strontium-90, cesium-137 and sometimes plutonium, right? What you don't know is that there are a hell of a lot of radioactive elements made when you fish in uranium. So when you put 100 tonnes of uranium in a nuclear power plant, like the Columbia Generating Plant, um, the atoms um, are very close together, and because they're shooting out neutrons all the time, neutrons hit another atom, that breaks apart and shoots out more neutrons, and it produces what's called a sustained reaction and, and it splits apart the atoms, producing the energy that Einstein discovered, E equals mc squared. Energy equals the mass of the atom times the speed of light squared. An enormous amount of energy. And that's the energy you get when you blow up a bomb, hydrogen or atomic. In nuclear reactors, it's controlled fission, so it doesn't usually blow up except sometimes. <laughs> Where it did at Chernobyl, and it did at Unit 3 in Fukushima. There was a nuclear reaction. They say it can't happen, but it does. So let's start from the top and go through fairly quickly all of these elements. So here's tritium. Now tritium is used in exit signs often and the, the, the signs on airport runways as the plane taxis to the, um, to the airport. Um, it is... Um, Hydrogen, basically radioactive hydrogen, which combines with oxygen to form tritiated water. All nuclear power plants emit tritium all the time. Each reactor requires 100 tonnes of water, um, 100, sorry, I've forgotten my, it's 100 tonnes of water per minute to keep it cool. And so it, am I right, is it 100 or is it more? Come on. 450,000, okay half a million yeah, per minute circulating to keep it cool and tritium gets into that water and then it goes out into the available river, lake or ocean. It also is emitted into the air and there's nothing that will stop the egress of tritium except gold because gold is very dense and if you put it in gold it won't get out but if you put it in anything else, glass or Often they use tritium in watches so that you can see in the dark, because it glows in the dark. Tritium escapes from everything, but particularly they can't stop it getting out. So people living near reactors are in danger just from tritium, which actually does concentrate in food, and, and it's sucked up by the, the roots of the trees, up the xylem vessels into the leaves, and then at, at, at night it sort of drips down from the leaves. It gets into the fog around a reactor, and they found in Germany and other studies that children under the age of five living within five kilometres, you don't do kilometres, do you? Like all the rest of the world, but you stick to miles, right? <laughs> so about two miles from a reactor have double the incidence of leukaemia and a very high incidence of solid cancer children. Um, and that's confirmed with a study in Britain and France. Uh, so it's dangerous to live anywhere near a nuclear power plant. But they also emit lots of other things from time to time, particularly when they re refuel once a year. A lot of stuff gets out, but what they do is take that amount of radiation and they average it out over 365 days, so each day it's very low. But in fact, if you're there when they're refueling, you might incur and inhale uh, radioactive elements to later induce cancer. So that's tritium, and then we'll just go down. Radioactive beryllium, carbon, of course. Carbon is a, an essential element 
of the human body. Carbon-14 lasts a long time. It hasn't got its half-lives here, but carbon is in the DNA molecule. Silicon, phosphorus, sulfur-35, chlorine-36, two isotopes of argon, potassium, and the body is rich in potassium. Um, and if you want to um, stop your heart, you can give yourself an a, a injection of potassium chloride and your heart will stop straight away. That's just a little hint. <laughs> I might do that one day. I've told my daughter she's a doctor and she's very disgusted. Um, two elements of calcium, of course, that's for teeth and bones, scandium, vanadium, manganese, two elements of iron, which is imperative for haemoglobin in the body. Cobalt-60 is terribly dangerous, a very high-energy gamma emitter and beta. Two of nickel, zinc, selenium, krypton, which is a gas, rubinium, strontium-90, which lasts for 300 to 600 years and causes bone cancer and leukaemia because it deposits in the bone because it's a calcium analogue. Yttrium. Niobium, how many there? Five. Molybdenum, and technetium, ruthium, rhodium, palladium. Look at all of these in silver. And they found high levels of radioactive silver in the cattle around Fukushima. And probably still is. Um, cadmium, indium, tin. Look at all the tin isotopes that, that are made. Antimony. Bismuth. Polonium. Polonium is, a, is an alpha emitter and highly carcinogenic, and it's probably polonium in cigarette smoke that induces lung cancer. Not so much the tar, but the polonium that concentrates on the tiny hairs of the tobacco leaves from the air, naturally occurring. It is a daughter of uranium, which occurs naturally, but it's also made in nuclear reactors, and it's probably the polonium that, what, that articles in the New England Journal have said causes it lung cancer. Radon, you know, all know about radon, that um, is naturally occurring, and if you've got a cellar, especially in the northeast, radon accumulates, and it's one of the main causes of lung cancer, and is uh, estimated by your government to be a major carcinogen. Frankium, never heard of that. Radium, that what, that's what gave Madame Curie uh, cancer. She, um, she um, isolated radium, I think two, two, three, from pitch blend, and she liked it. She used to carry it around in her lab coat pocket, playing with it. And she died of aplastic anemia, which means her whole bone marrow stopped producing any red or white blood cells or platelets. She was so radioactive they had to bury her in a radioactive waste facility. Her daughter also worked with her and she died of leukaemia too. That's before we knew, but that was a long time ago. We've known for a long time. Actinium, thorium, thorium, they want to make nuclear power plants out of thorium and there are thorium trolls trolling me on Facebook at the moment, not on Twitter, um, not knowing that thorium is a totally inadequate material to put in a nuclear power plant because it's not naturally fissionable. You can ask me that about, that about that later. Proctinium, uranium, look at all the uranium elements, all of which are in nuclear reactors. Neptunium, which is an alpha emitter, terribly dangerous, and plutonium, of course, 239 is about the most toxic material um, that we know, most carcinogenic. 238 is used to power batteries for space expl exploration. Tonium 241 converts to, uh, uh, to americium 241, and here it is, which is much more toxic than plutonium 241, and they're worried in Europe after Chernobyl that the plutonium will convert to 241, which is a high energy gamma emitter and tremendously carcinogenic. So generations hence will be exposed to a lot of americium 241. Curium is also an alpha emitter, named after Madame Curie, of course. And then there's berkelium named after Berkeley and Californium named after guess what? So they're the elements that are in a reactor. Now, at Chernobyl, there was a man who was um, an expert in hydroelectricity, not nuclear, but he was in charge of the reactor one night. It had only been running for three months, so there wasn't a huge amount of fissionable material in it, or fission products, but there's a fair bit. And he did an experiment in the middle of the night, and there was a huge bang. And the control room filled up with white dust, and he said to his two young men, Help us go out and see what's happened. 
And they went out and came back and said, it's gone. He said, what's gone? And they said, the reactor's gone. And he said, don't be ridiculous. Go out and have another look. It had gone. It had exploded. And then it burnt because the control rods which moderate the neutrons were made of carbon. And they burnt. And they burnt for at least 10 days. And so the tremendous heat forced the isotopes right up into the stratosphere. Now, here we are in the Ukraine. Chernobyl. Guess how many nuclear power plants there are in the Ukraine where America is confronting Russia right now? The neocons in the State Department probably don't even know about that and don't care. Fifteen. You can't have a conventional war in a country with nuclear power plants because any of them can be easily melted down by a missile or a cessation of electricity. So we're in a very precarious situation at the moment, and that's apart from the fact that both Russia and America, who own 94% of the 16,400 hydrogen bombs, have both their missiles uh, on a high alert, ready to go with the press of the button and a three-minute decision time by Putin or Obama. Have you ever read about that in the major press or the New York Times? It's a very tricky, very dangerous situation we're in, both from the nuclear reactors being vulnerable and the weapons. And we've come close to nuclear war on numerous occasions. Now, this is the, the, the fallout. Um, incredibly radioactive, the red areas. These are not exclusion zones. People aren't allowed to live there anymore. Um, and then the, the lesser ones, the more sort of orangey ones, there were, there were, well, you can see, Sweden got a hell of a dose, and that's where they first picked up the radiation, and they said, what's going on? And Gorbachev and Russia didn't tell anyone for about 10 days. Norway, Finland, there are farms in, in England now whose lambs are so radioactive and full of cesium they can't be sold in the market. Um, and you can see it, there, are, there are radioactive wild boars running around Germany that are so radioactive they almost glow in the dark and they have to be buried in radioactive waste facilities. And these elements last, some of them, for hundreds and hundreds of years and some thousands of years. Now you know what sort of elements are all over Europe. Turkey got a huge fallout, it's not on the map. Don't eat Turkish dried apricots. And most of the, um, uh, what do you use for your coffee to flavor it? Hazelnuts are grown in Turkey. Um, the Turkey, the, the Turks were so annoyed with Russia, they picked all the radioactive tea and sent it to Russia so they could drink the tea. <laughs> um, so that just shows you what happened from Chernobyl. And let me tell you that there's been a study done by many, many Russians, written papers in, in Slavic, which have been translated by the New York Academy of Sciences. And by now, estimates are over a million people have already died from this dreadful, dreadful catastrophe. So you can see one stupid man with a nuclear power plant can contaminate a whole continent. That's the lesson. And nuclear re um, accidents never end because the isotopes remain in the ground to reconcentrate back in the food, back in the grass, thousands of times, back in the milk and the meat. And then as we stand at the apex of the food chain, they concentrate most highly in us. They're invisible, they're tasteless, they're odorless, and we don't know if we're eating radioactive food. Okay, now here's Fukushima. This is before and after the earthquake. What happened was there was an earthquake of nine on the Richter scale out in the Pacific. The reactors were built, they, they excavated a cliff. They could have built them high up above the Pacific, but they excavated a cliff and built them at sea level. And so when the uh, earthquake occurred, A, these reactors lost external power. A million gallons a minute, that's how, how much water had, needs to circulate in each reactor to keep it cool. Incidentally, these complexes of a reactor are called nuclear power plants. Notice the euphemism. Plants grow in the soil and have chlorophyll. Fancy calling these revolting things plants, number one. Always look at the language that the Pentagon uses in the Department of Energy. So they lost their external power supply. But then they have underneath them great big diesel generators the size of a house. So if they lose their external power supply, the generators kick in and keep the pumps running to circulate the cooling water. So then in came the tsunami, 45 feet tall, um, and the wall to protect them was only about 15 feet tall. So the whole thing was flooded. 
And you saw the pictures of the tsunami going inland, taking cars, boats, houses, people and everything. And so the diesel generators were drowned. Because, therefore, there was no circulation of cooling water, there were meltdowns within a few days in units one, two and three. The Japanese people were not told for three months that there be, had been meltdowns. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission knew about it, but they didn't tell you. And as well as that, there were four hydrogen explosions because zirconium covering the fuel rods reacts with water at high temperatures and air, causing hydrogen. And because these reactors didn't have proper venting systems, and I know the three GE engineers who designed them, and they resigned from GE in 1975 because they knew these reactors were dangerous. The hydrogen built up and exploded in units one, two, three, and four. And then there was another big explosion in unit two, three, which they think was a fuel pool on top of the reactors. Fuel pools, euphemistically called swimming pools, contain huge amounts of radioactive re fuel rods removed from the reactor every year, about 30 tonnes per year. And so there was a nuclear explosion here. And these reactors ended up looking like this. Um, and at the moment, lots of hydrogen is still being produced um, by the zirconium and the molten cores, which have melted right through the, the containment vessel probably into the earth, and that's called by the nuclear industry a melt through to China syndrome. A hundred tons of terribly hot radioactive lava has gone into the earth or in the containment vessel, which is all now cracked and broken. Um, so they're injecting nitrogen in to dilute the hydrogen so we won't have any more hydrogen explosions, but it's pretty tenuous what's happening. And this was what it looked like. Can you believe it? Look at it. It's like Chernobyl. Another one, reactor one. And this is an inside look, but it's not too clear, so don't worry about that one. Um, this was released by the Australian Radiation Service on March the 11th, and uh, March 2000. And this was the uh, potential fallout, which has actually come to pass. So here's Japan, and here are you. So within three, and this is the airborne radiation. And for the first two days, the, the wind was blowing from the west towards the east, towards you. And the ambient levels of radiation in Seattle went up 40,000 times above normal. Did you know that? And if you didn't know, why didn't you know it? And if you weren't told by the government, why not? Because you elect the government to represent you and not the corporations. Huh? <laughs> the government, all the people in the government, the Congress and the President, are your, you're their leaders. You are their leaders and they are your representatives. And if you don't use your democracy to make sure they do what you want them to do and you go and see them every week when they come home, etc., then it's your fault that things are going wrong and you lose your democracy. Democracy requires a lot of work, not just tweeting and Facebooking, going and seeing these characters and taking the doctors with you and sitting down and explaining to them what I'm explaining to you now. So they understand, because most politicians are scientifically illiterate. Okay, so here, um, the Tokyo University did this as, as a, a model of where the radiation went. So the meltdown occurred on the 11th of March, so here's the 18th. Here, there you are, and then the 21st, three days later, here you are, and it's covering... They even found Americium in Boston, um, which is where my grandchildren live and then it starts circling the northern hemisphere, which it did, and, and, and the radiation was found all over the place. Um, this is released by the US Department of Energy. Now, after two days, the wind changed and blew inwards towards Japan. And although America was monitoring where the radiation went with their aeroplanes, measuring the gamma radiation in the cloud of radioactive elements, and the Japanese government also knew they didn't tell the people because they didn't want to create panic. You mustn't have the people panicking if you tell them the truth. In medicine, we have to tell you the truth and you might even panic. But then we help you with your grief and you, we help you through the diagnosis. So people fled into the path of the highest radiation levels. Very, very high levels. 
Um, and this is the, the high dose zone um, after the radioactive plume was discharged. A very high level was discharged on the 15th of March, pro probably following the explosions, and washed down by rain from the atmosphere on to various parts. And these red dots are extremely high levels of radiation. Uh, that just goes through what I've told you, basically. Radiation is insidious. You can't be detected by uh, sensors at all. Gamma radiation, like X-rays, which is when, when the isotopes are on the ground, just goes straight through your body. So you're living in a constant field of X-rays. Beta particles, um, and I, Alpha, I, des I, I describe that, what they do to genes. Um, well, they see, they only really talk about the nuclear industry, iodine, and everyone li living near a reactor, and probably you, should all have potassium iodide in your cabinets, medicine cabinets, because if there's a meltdown and the wind's blowing towards you from the Columbia Generating Station, and if you know that it's happening, and just before the radiation hits, you take potassium iodide, which saturates the thyroid gland so it won't take up radioactive iodine. It doesn't protect you against anything else. None of the other elements that you just saw can be protected against. There's no way we can get radioactive elements out of your body once you're contaminated. Iodine has a half-life of eight days, so it lasts for about six weeks. After Three Mile Island, um, which is 13 miles from um, Hershey's Chocolates, and it's in the middle of a very rich dairying area in America, uh, they, the iodine there was so much iodine in the cow's milk um, that they powdered the milk for six weeks until the iodine decayed away and then they used it for the chocolates. But cesium got out too, which you multiply by 10 or 20 years to find its total life. The half-life is 30 years. So say 300 years, don't eat Hershey's chocolates. Strontium-90 lasts for 600 years probably. Calcium analog, don't eat Hershey's chocolates. Plutonium-241, which decays to amaricium-241, I've described, nine years. Don't eat Hershey's chocolates. I've been saying it for, I don't know, 30 years, however long, and they haven't sued me. Um, they probably would be silly to sue me because then there'd be a big publicity about Hershey's chocolates. Now, this is in Tokyo. Tokyo got a huge fallout, and these are the azaleas in July dying in the middle of summer. And these are the ginkgo leaves with spots of radiation on them which have killed them. Um, now, what people don't know is that Tokyo got a very, very high fallout because it rained. And uh, the highest level of fallout was detected in the Tokyo metropolitan area of Saitama. Cesium radiation levels being detected at nearly a million becquerels per square metre. A becquerel is a disintegration per second of radiation, a level almost twice as high as the Chernobyl permanent dead zone evacuation limit of only half a million becquerels. Now, people want to go to Japan, they want to take their kids skiing, and you know, it's all fine. I just say, don't go to Japan. I've been there three times. You don't know what you're eating. You don't know where the fish is sourced. You don't know if you're eating rice from Fukushima, which they're actively growing now. If it's very radioactive, they dilute it with non-radioactive rice. But the solution to pollution by dilution is fallacious when it comes to radiation because it reconcentrates back in your body. Okay? Um, so, and, and I went to a, a sushi bar in New York recently. Everyone's in their best clothes drinking sakis. And I said, where are the fish from? They said, Japan. Hillary Clinton signed, and I got my sushi from New Zealand and Canada. Hillary Clinton signed just after the accident an agreement with Japan that they would, you, you would continue importing Japanese food. Don't elect her as president. <laughs> this, <laughs> Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, I don't know what, what to do, do you know? Anyway, so this is um, what happened at Chernobyl. These are very grossly deformed children birth defects, who were affected in utero by the radiation. That's a case of elephantiasis, lymphangiectasis. And these are very grossly mentally retarded children. There are homes full of the most grossly deformed children 
around Chernobyl, such that we've never seen in the history of paediatrics before. And that will continue for years. This is a very important book that you all must go to Amazon and buy right now. Consequences... All right, get it elsewhere. I don't care where you get it. Okay, so um, it's by Yablokov, Nesterenko and another Nesterenko with the 5,000 papers all um, uh, converted, to, translated to English. And this is a very interesting photograph taken by Tim Rousseau, who's, an, a, de develop, who's um, a developmental biologist, an evolutionary biologist. So the tree was growing normal with its xylem and phloem vessels till Chernobyl hit. And you can see how dense and how tiny the growth rings are post Chernobyl. Really, that says everything. What happens to plants, what happens to animals, happens to human beings. Now, the, National, the New York Academy of Sciences published this, and also the New York Academy, but because they've got a lot of pro-nuclear people on their board, they say they don't think it's worth reading anymore because it didn't get adequate peer review. Well, that's absolute rhubarb, because, <laughs> as we say in Australia, because... You know, you've got very strict standards of peer review, but it's the most fascinating book I've ever read in medicine, and the sort of diseases that in, were incurred were extraordinary. Diabetes, because cesium concentrates in the pancreas. Cesium also concentrates in the thyroid gland. Uh, premature aging, children, it's called progeria. Having premature aging symptoms of heart attacks, children dropping dead of heart attacks because cesium concentrates in the cardiac muscle and produces irregularities. This has all been done by a, a, a very good Russian scientist. Um, huge numbers of cancers and leukemias, uh, babies being born deformed, as I've said, and the like. So new diseases are being described, and the nuclear people get in and will violate this important, terribly important study uh, because they want to continue with nuclear power, and they make me very annoyed. Now, this was uh, a book that I commissioned um, by Arjun Makajani, a brilliant plasma physicist. He did it a few years ago, and it was said that at one of my conferences that America can generate all the electricity it needs and be carbon and nuclear free, and we said that's impossible. So I set up the study, and in fact, Arjun found that by 2050, but it's more like 2020, you can be totally carbon free and nuclear free. Why aren't there solar panels on every house in Washington State? They're all over Germany and they have as much rain and, you know, cloud as you. The sun gets through the clouds and generates electricity. Why aren't there windmills everywhere? Why do you have a nuclear power plant here, for God's sake? Um, you know, so, and, and burning coal just has to stop, stop now because predictions are it's going to be six degrees centigrade hotter by the end of this century meaning our children and grandchildren and descendants will not be able to live. We can't live at those temperatures. I don't know how to get the politicians onto this, except to remove the oil, coal and, uh, what is the other one? Gas, natural gas companies from putting money in their pockets. I mean, you've got, <laughs> you've got a courtocracy, not a democracy. Now... This is Tim Rousseau's work. He goes into the evacuation zones of Chernobyl and Fukushima to the detriment of his health. And he's looking at the barn swallows and the insects to see what, what's happening to them. These white, little white spots are mutations on their feathers. There's one there, um, and I think that's all mutation. There's a tumour here, abnormal beak here. I can't tell what that is. Um, and their tail feathers are abnormal. These are all mutations. 40% of the male birds are sterile, uh, can't reproduce. So, uh, and that's, well, that happens to humans too. And, and, and they've, most of them they examine have cataracts, and we know very well that radiation induces cataracts, and they found there are a lot of, lot of cataracts in Belarus and the Ukraine and the like. And incidentally, the Ukraine, where all this mess is going on, is incredibly radioactive. And they've got... <laughs> they're, they're, they're developing these diseases which uh, are not being talked about. Now, I don't have a map of America, for which I apologise. But this just gives you an indication of Europe right now. So here's the Ukraine. 
Um, and these are all the operative nuclear power plants. The black ones are non-operative. Look at them, 15 in the Ukraine. Russia, look at them all. And, and the nuclear industry, your nuclear industry, is rushing around the world selling them to the United Arab Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, to pa um, Pakistan, to anyone who'll buy them. And they are truly criminal because nuclear power induces cancer, leukemia, genetic diseases um, for the rest of time. What I haven't talked about is that we all have several, abnormal, um, several hundred abnormal genes in our eggs and sperm. And you don't know unless you breed with someone with the same gene, a recessive gene. For instance, uh, you can't have blue eyes unless you have two blue-eyed genes, right? If you have a brown eye, that's dominant, and a blue-eyed recessive gene, you have brown eyes. So here's a quiz. Two parents with blue eyes had a brown-eyed child. Where did the brown-eyed gene come from? What? Yeah, the milkman. So we all carry genes for cystic fibrosis. One in uh, 2,500 of us carry the gene for CF. Um, and we all carry, well, recently, and I've been going around the world for 40 years saying this as a pediatrician, my specialty is cystic fibrosis, and many of my patients died under the age of 10. They are now having heart-lung transplants. But I discovered recently that my beloved older son has hemochromatosis which is a recessive gene inherited from his father and me, um, and it's an abnormality in iron metabolism where they can't get rid of their iron, so it collects in the liver, causing cirrhosis, in the heart muscle, causing damage to the heart. And the way he's treated is he gets venosected every few weeks. You know, litres of blood are taken from him to keep the iron levels low. But you see, you don't know what you've got till you start reproducing and and watch your grandchildren and the like. So that's a lesson. Look at France, they're nuts. And if there's a, and you know, the French love their food, but you can imagine how much tritium is escaping in all sorts of nuclides from the French reactors. The Spanish are into it, and I've been to Spain lecturing them about that, but they didn't take any notice. What can you do? These are all closed down in Britain, but they're going to build more because it's very exciting. Um, <laughs> And you know, there's something about, I, I wrote a book called Missile Envy. <laughs> and all the generals hated it, but every single general had a copy on his bookshelf in the Pentagon. Well, I think that E equals MC squared is a substitute probably for male, will I say it? Erection and ejaculation. Um, and they like it, and it's this sort of energy that really grabs them. And I'm going to write a book about this called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them, and I'll go into all of this sort of dynamics and, <coughs> and psychiatry and philosophy and hormone receptors in the brain and the like. But there's got to be something about this, you see, and it's mostly men in charge of the nuclear industry. Um, Norway, you'll see, is non-nuclear, and Denmark. And there was a man in Denmark who said, I don't want to have a child with six fingers. Hmm? And Denmark now sells wind power all over the world. Germany is closing its reactors down by 2022 um, because uh, Merkel, who's a physicist, got such a fright after, Chino and after Fukushima that she agreed to close them down. And Germany now leads one of the world's leaders in renewable energy. Why aren't you, for God's sake? I thought Americans had a lot of initiative and creativity. Get going. This is a tomato that was uh, grown in Fukushima. You know what that is, it's mutations. So that's it. There's, there's lots more I can say about Fukushima. It's not over. It's Every day, 400 tonnes of highly radioactive water are pouring into the Pacific and heading towards you. And because the radiation bioaccumulates in the fish, hundreds of times in the algae, hundreds more times in the crustaceans, hundreds more times in the little fish, the big fish in us, and you can't taste it, it's heading towards you. I live in a fishing village in Australia on the Pacific. Fish swim thousands of miles. There's a very big current um, that goes straight from the east coast of Japan over to you and it's heading towards you. It hasn't quite hit yet, I think. 
and it's really quite radioactive. Your government is not testing the seawater, it's not testing the fish, and it's not testing the ambient air because if there's another earthquake, Building 3, which is very fragile, could well collapse onto the molten core and release huge amounts of radiation and there could be a, a sort of a nuclear fire or volcano and your ambient air should be being tested continuously by the EPA. It's not. Furthermore, the, the reactors were built with a mountain range behind them and water pours down every day under the reactors, which was fine when they were intact. But now, with three molten cores, each of 100 tonnes, with all those isotopes I showed you, the water is washing over them and becoming extremely radioactive and going into the Pacific. There's no way they can get to those cores because they're so radioactive, men will die. They send robots in there, they get fried. And I predict, and so do many nuclear engineers, that this problem will never be solved. People are still living in highly radioactive areas. Now, 104 children under the age of 18 in the Fukushima prefecture have thyroid cancer. The incidence of thyroid cancer in that population is one or two per million. Oh, but the industry says it's not caused by Fukushima um, because this cancer started too early. They occurred four years after Chernobyl but these started occurring two years after. It just means the kids got a really high dose. And it's, it's, it's prognosticated that because they got a high dose, more and more cancers are going to appear in that exposed population for this generation and all the rest because they're eating radioactive food all the time. So they say, oh, you can only have 100 becquerels per kilogram of radiation in your milk or your meat, but if you keep eating it every day, of course, the cesium, the strontium and the like keeps accumulating in various organs. Do you see what I mean? Don't eat any seaweed, any miso, any rice or anything from Japan. Don't let any kids go to Japan. Um, and I'll just finish by saying it's lucky the earthquake occurred in the afternoon on Friday because there were over a thousand people at Fukushima Daiichi and just down the coast is Fukushima Daini with four nuclear power plants. They were terribly disturbed and the whole thing was, was about to melt down there too. Now, if it had occurred in the middle of the night, there would have been 100 people only at Daiichi and Daini. And in fact, it would have been, as David Suzuki says in Canada, bye-bye Japan. I know Naoto Khan, and in fact, he opened the conference that I had a year ago at the New York Academy of Medicine. And this is the book, Crisis Without End, with the, all the papers that were presented there, oceanographers, epidemiologists, Tim Mousseau. It's really a short, easy to read, and full of facts. It's the first book of its kind. And Naoto Khan was having to consider evacuating Tokyo. 35 million people. That still could happen. And every day, um, Hundreds of tons are sucked out because they're pouring water all the time to keep the cores cool. And that water is recirculating and putting into three-storey tanks, which are stuck together with plastic and corroding bolts. And there are over a thousand of them. And if there's another earthquake, those tanks will collapse and all the water will go into the Pacific. But they're running out of room for the tanks, so they're asking the fishermen, please, can we allow this incredibly radioactive water just to go straight into the Pacific? So every day it's about 400 tonnes of radioactive water and then you've got also these tanks and the other water has to be stored. So it's a hell of a mess. Um, your media is not covering it. There's a big cover-up. Obama is a nuclear president. Exelon paid a quarter of a million dollars to get him elected. Um, and you're in trouble. Okay, well, we'll stop now, and I bet you've got lots of questions. Um, I assure you it's not that I'm looking for something more to worry about. Um, but I've been to Basra and the Highway of Death, and I'd like to ask you so I can understand the dust from the depleted uranium that the doctors there all identify as the cause of all the birth defects we've seen. WPSR has been there. Is that the same phenomena of particulate radiation 
it's being carried in the winds from Japan. Or is no, it no like it's, you've been using uranium weapons in, in Iraq for a long time, radioactive weapons. It's really a nuclear war that's been going on there. Yes. And when these uranium shells, uranium is 1.7 times more dense than lead. And so as momentum equals mass by velocity, it's big in mass and it just penetrates the armour of a tank like a hot knife through butter, but 80% of it burns producing tiny particles less than five microns in diameter to be inhaled into the lungs. And it's scattered around the desert. The children play in the destroyed tanks. It concentrates in the food. It gets into the water. Um, and in Basra, there are so many congenital anomalies now that the doctors have told the mothers to stop having babies. And it's the same in Fallujah. And there's a very high incidence of tumours, of cancers in children, um, and they can't treat most of them because they, because of the sanction you, you imposed upon them, and God knows what's happening now. And uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, so you've contaminated, and Australia has too. The uranium in the Fukushima reactors was our uranium. Contaminated the cradle of civilization between the Euphrates and Tigris for forever. The wind blows that dust in, into, Bas into Baghdad and all around. Well, they use the weapons in Baghdad too. Yeah, but not as much. But that's not my question. It is still trying to understand the dust that's blown. Is that different than the air that carries radiation from Japan? And how so is it? No, it's not different. It's just uranium instead of strontium or cesium or whatever. It's, uh -huh. it's an alpha emitter like plutonium and extremely carcinogenic and mutagenic. It's the same sort of thing. Uh -huh. So it is particulate radiation that comes on the Well, air. it's aerosolized size. Yeah. Less than five microns can be inhaled into the terminal bronchi and it gets into the terminal bronchi and then it's transferred yeah. by macrophages into the lymph glands and the like. Thank you so much for all you do. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, really, thank you for all you've done. Uh, my question is a bit minor. You've m mentioned much worse things since, but could you run down the arguments against thorium for me? Yeah, thorium is not naturally fissionable. So you have to produce, you have to enrich uranium-235 above 3%, which is normally used in your nuclear power plants, above 3%, which is itself fissionable. Or you have to reprocess plutonium out of your spent fuel and that's a terribly dangerous process. You put the spent fuel rods in concentrated nitric acid, melt them, and by chemical process, remove the plutonium, which you can use for your bombs, and you've got lots of bombs, um, and it can be mixed with the thorium. And so as the uranium-235 or plutonium is mixed with thorium, the thorium turns into uranium-233 and 232. And I think it's a 233 that's naturally fissionable. So it starts after a while, after concentrating, to sustain itself, or you have to reprocess that fuel and melt it down to get out the uranium-233. Uranium-232, though, is deadly toxic. It is a huge gamma emitter, and so it's terribly, terribly dangerous. And it's too expensive to go through these steps to get a fissionable product. And there are thorium people who, I don't know where their heads are, but there have been a lot of studies done, and I wrote a paper, re an article recently for the Huffington Post about this. It's economically absolutely unsustainable, as is nuclear power, compared to renewables and conservation and Americans' waste, 28% of the electricity they use by leaving everything on. In Germany, you know, you go to a hotel and the light turns on the hall, and then within a few minutes it turns off automatically. I don't know why people think, and you know, when you walk through a door and it opens, in, that's a global warming door, or it's a cancer door. Think of the way you use electricity, escalators, doors, everything. You don't use clothes dryers. Hang your clothes outside to dry in the nuclear reactor in the sky in the summer, and we all hang our clothes outside in Australia, and in the winter hang them up in the basement next to the, and they dry in a flash. But there are laws in this country saying you're not allowed to hang your underpants outside or your brassiers because Mrs. Brown might see them, you know? That's really queer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I want to go back to Iraq uh, and what happened. Uh, 
Uh, I am interested personally in uh, seeing any studies that you might be aware of about the human toll that the crimes of the U.S. since yeah. 91 uh, has done to the... Are there any studies documenting what really uh, happened? This is number one. Number two, I think the standard we measure by in terms of nuclear uh, stuff is uh, the uh, Nagasaki and the Hiroshima bombs. I am interested also in knowing if there is a way to uh, quantify uh, how many Nagasaki or Hiroshima bombs have the U.S. dropped on Iraq since 91, if there is something um, uh, Well, A, we don't know because the Pentagon won't tell us and we try and get data and we can't get any data. And the New York Times, I wrote a piece of the New York Times about six, eight years ago about depleted uranium and they wouldn't publish it. They said, we're unable to publish this, meaning who's telling them they can't? And if the Pentagon tells them they can't, then you don't have a free press. But we've known in medicine for years what uranium does. We actually did use to use it in our patients. There's a very large literature on uranium. Um, and if you look at this book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, there is a section on depleted uranium here explaining everything. It's handled... It's a heavy metal, it's excreted by the kidney, causes kidney cancer, bladder cancer, um, and many other cancers. So, um, and it goes to the bone, it's deposited in bone and teeth. So if you want to look it up, it's here. Yeah. Tom. So you've been to Japan three times, and you've visited and spoken with people. What's your estimate of women, Japanese women, how how much they've led the anti-nuclear movement, how much they uh, have stopped, so, so no reactors have opened up since Fukushima, yeah. et cetera. What's, what's your feeling about that? Well, women, um, they have a bigger corpus callosum than men connecting the right and left brains. So their intuitive senses are actually usually more developed than males. And of course, our hormones are, are there to nurture life. You know, it's why we have periods and... And, and the whole thing. Um, and therefore, and they, when you have a child, you'll do anything. You'll die to protect your child. And the women rose up. And they're very powerful. They're carting radioactive waste all around Japan and incinerating it. So they're sharing the radiation in Osaka and Kyoto and everything. It's just, it's really awful, I tell you. And so the women rise up, but you know, Japan's a very autocratic society, and what I learnt was that, you know, they bow all the time and apologise, even though they've done wicked things, but that one thing you mustn't experience is shame. For your family or yourself, if you do something bad, you feel terrible shame, and that's the worst thing you can have. Now, I think it's the Irish and the Jews, you know, it's guilt. But in Japan, it's shame. And everyone follows the leader, and they've got a really bad prime minister now called Abe, who wants to violate their peaceful constitution held to be set up by General MacArthur. And now they're going to build weapons, and America wants them to, and is encouraging them to. And America is encouraging them to open their nuclear power plants. And, and Japan exports nuclear reactors and parts of reactors all over the world, and that's what Abe's been doing recently, travelling around the world selling parts for nuclear reactors. And I want to tear my hair out because what I haven't mentioned is radioactive waste, which is Hanford, which is the reactors. You've got 77,000 tonnes of radioactive waste from your reactors stored on the roof of the reactors, protected by a Kmart-type Kmart roof, OK? And at Hanford, I mean, it's just a dreadful mess which will never be cleaned up. The Columbia River has been the most radioactive river in the world. And once a man worked at Hanford, went down to the mouth of the Columbia, ate some oysters that were caught there, went back, walked through the radiation detector and it went crazy. Don't swim in the Columbia. Don't eat fish from the Columbia. And Hanford is going to go on forever for the rest of time, killing you to make the bombs to kill you better. That's really what it's all about. Radioactive waste lasts for a million years, according to the EPA, must be sort isolated from the ecosphere for a million years. And they've got a thing called the Waste Confidence Bill. They are confident 
that one day they'll find the answer to storage of radioactive waste. It's like having a cancer confidence bill. One day we'll find the cure to cancer. Or a death confidence bill. One day we'll find the answer to death. I mean, it's, talk about unscientific wickedness. Um, and so you've got huge amounts of liquid radioactive waste at Hanford and Savannah River from making the bombs. And over time, this stuff is going to leak out of any container, be it iron, titanium, whatever, within 100 years, get into the water supply, filter in, bioconcentrate in your food for the rest of time, and people will wake in the morning having deformed babies because they've been exposed in utero as they're developing in the first trimester, babies getting leukemia and cancer at the age of six instead of 60, babies being born with genetic disease, breast milk radioactive, so epidemics of cancer, genetic disease and deformities. That's what, that's what this means. It means, shh. It means that, that we are inducing random compulsory genetic engineering for the rest of time with this damn nuclear thing. And we've got to cut these guys off at the ankles because it's insane. I mean, you know, if there was one case of rabies in Seattle, what would, I mean, it would be headlines, wouldn't it? But cancer, oh well. And who's helped to, get help to help, who's helped a, a cancer patient to die? Hands up. You know how hideous it is. I've spent my life trying to save lives and I just can't comprehend what's going on at the moment. It's beyond my comprehension. But it's up to us to stop it. Yeah. Yes. Um, regarding causes, well, you said that representatives represent the corporations, they don't represent the people. And I would s add to that that they're locked, they're, they're, they're bought and, and bank, bankrolled entirely by the corporations. Yeah. And we live in a society, a capitalist society that is based on unsustainable growth. And this is, to me, is what is, what is behind, underneath all of this. Of course. And my question is, uh, do you feel that we need a revolution yes, to overturn capitalism? Yes, absolutely you need a revolution. On so if and bring any on country, socialism. If any country needed a revolution, you need one. And lots of you are probably Christians and don't forget Jesus was a socialist. Right. Leave thy earthly goods and follow me. It's more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. See not the mote in the other person's eye. Look instead at the mote in your own eye. Socialism's bloody good. We've got it in Australia. We've got free health care. If you get sick, you go to a public hospital, not charge a thing, and you have the best medical care in the world. That's a civilised society where your tax dollars go for you and for education, not 50% of your discretionary budget going to build bombs in the Pentagon to, for Lockheed Martin, for Boeing, for Northrop Grumman, for Raytheon. This is wicked. Your tax dollars go for killing. Our, doc, our tax dollars go for life, and you've got to change that. The nuclear industry is totally socialised. You, in fact, are a communist country because the whole weapons industry is socialised, and the Pentagon, and so is the nuclear industry. You're a communist country. Let's be frank, Frank. So it's communism. It's communism for the corporations and capitalism for all of you people. Go and hear Naomi Klein. One more question. One more question. Um, so you, you mentioned how much uh, radiation had already been over Seattle. So what does that say about the food that's grown here? Well, I don't know. I mean, how can I say? Is it being measured? Huh? Is it being measured? Is the radiation in the oh. food being measured? I can't no. guess. Well, it has... Well, um, Miriam, do you want to s quickly say something quick? Well, Miriam's measuring... Are you measuring the food here, Miriam? So, yeah, the, um, Just very quickly. Measuring food is a little bit difficult. Uh, my organization is called RADCAST. It's R-A-D-C-A-S-T dot org. We're taking samples of food that people want to give us. Uh, we can only test for gamma. Helen talked a lot about the different types of radiation. 
Um, if you get in touch with us, we can potentially help measure food that you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, but the government should be doing it. You shouldn't have to do it, and it's your government. It's your government. And you've got to go and make friends with your legislators and say, now, look, if you don't do what I say, you're not getting elected next year, and you will walk around to every house and door knock on the house and teach your public what's going on. That's called democracy. Not sitting at computers doing Twittering, which I do, and Facebooking. It's getting out, using your bodies like the wonderful people in Wisconsin did when they took over the State House. It's time. And I just want to say one more thing. Revolution, we had a revolution in the 80s. We had a peaceful revolution. When I first came here and I started PSR in 1978, um, most people I talked to said, it's better to be dead than red. And I thought, what? Oh, we don't want to be communists. And I thought, this is psychotic. So we got together, I don't know how many, 30, 35, 135, I can't remember how many, 23,000 physicians, and we started dropping the bomb on Seattle and on Boston and describing the medical effects. And the journalist said, well, what are doctors talking about this? This is political. We said, no, it's medical. And so we blanketed the country with media and education and I was often on the media because I had a Hollywood agent who worked for me for free. And in five years, 80% of Americans were opposed to nuclear weapons. That was a peaceful, sagacious revolution, a Gandhian revolution in thinking. And that's what we've got to do again. And as President Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. This democracy is not informed. If you get up and start going and, and educating your legislators, you'll get in the media. Then they'll say, why, why are you aggravating this one and talking and taking doctors and stuff? And then you have access to the media. Peaceful, educational. It's, it's education that we need. Yeah. Yeah, okay, go on. I was just wondering if uh, South America or Australia would be safer um, long term than around here. Yeah the, north, yeah, the southern hemisphere at the moment, because of Fukushima, is and will be safer than the northern hemisphere. Because the two air masses don't mix at the equator. So when all the bomb tests happened, the fallout basically occurred in the northern hemisphere, except when the British came down to Australia and we let them blow up bombs and I got a very, very high fallout in Adelaide where I live and I've got a multi-nodular thyroid gutter and so is my brother. But in the, on the whole, and because of your, all your reactors here, you've got 103. I mean, it's not if but when there's another meltdown. If it's in America, that'll be the end of nuclear power. Because let's be frank, Americans don't seem to take a lot of notice of Russians getting cancer. And when I was on the ABC radio just after Chernobyl, the man, man said, but they're all communists. And I said, but they're people, they're human beings, they're patients. And then, uh, you know, Japan sort of, they've passed a new law in Japan to say that any reporter reporting on Fukushima can be jailed for 10 years. It's a secrecy law, yes. And they're not reporting on anything else and they're only looking at thyroid cancer. There's a huge cover up. And so if there's a meltdown in Indian Point, 35 miles from Manhattan, and people are dying of acute radiation illness with their hair falling out, vomiting and bleeding to death in Manhattan and they'll never get out through the tunnels and the bridges and then they start getting leukemia and stuff. What do you think that'll mean to the nuclear industry? And Indian Point is just near an earthquake. Diablo Canyon is built right on an earthquake. See, you're in serious trouble. Why don't you lead the world and show, you, show the world what a fantastic nation you are and close all the re reactors? That'll be great. We'll be very pleased if you do that.